Good day, child of God. This is the Remnant Seed Bible Study Channel. Welcome. Today's subject is uh, rapture in court. We're going to take the rapture doctrine to court. We're going to run it through the mill. We're going to get discovery. We're going to cross-examine. And we're just going to figure this out. Okay. Now, I got all your, we're going to call this case number 777. You like that? And basically, I've compiled all these scriptures that the rap, pre-tribulation rapture believers use to bolster their doctrine. This is, these are the scriptures from what I can gather, you know, give or take a few of them. These are the ones they use to promote the pre-tribulation rapture. And so the evidence um, is right here. This is their evidence. This is what they will produce uh, to um, bolster the rapture doctrine. Okay, and then we're going to ask these questions. Is the word rapture in the Bible? And we know that the word is not in the Bible, the entire Bible. There is no mention of the word rapture. Is a pre-tribulation rapture mentioned in the Bible? The answer is no. The concept of a, of a rapture uh, before tribulation or before 2 Thessalonians 2, uh, 4, 2, 4 is not mentioned, beloved. Now, is there a rapture first and then the second coming? And the answer is no, beloved. There is, there is, there is no scriptural basis for two second comings. None. It's not mentioned anywhere, directly, indirectly, anywhere, anywhere. It's not there, beloved. It's just not there. Okay, now what we're looking for is any evidence of a pre-tribulation rapture in the scriptures they present below, and I'm going to go through every one of them, beloved. A simple step-by-step -step of who, what, where, when, and where, and how, and we'll find out that really the only one we need in this formula is the when, and this is the one, only one we're going to look for, beloved, uh, when we examine chronology. It, it, that's the only one you can look at when you're examining chron chronology, beloved. And this examination will focus on nothing but the proof of, proof of chronology and nothing else, beloved. Don't get sidetracked within the evidence uh, that they have presented themselves. We're going to scrutinize all of their evidence. Each scripture will be examined for any existence of chronology and nothing else. Their claim is that these scriptures support the chronology of the rapture, which is pre-tribulation. That's their claim. They claim that the rapture occurs before the great tribulation of Matthew 24. Now, we're only looking uh, for evidence of when, and that's it. We're not going to look at any other evidence, beloved. We'll keep this really simple and focused. We also cannot lose sight of the fact that they're using these scriptures to promote the, promote the chronology of the, the pre-tribulation rapture, which, is they claim, which they claim is before the Great Tribulation. This is their claim. Now, these are the scriptures they would use to support their case, or in, another, uh, in a different scenario, we could use this. Uh, the post-tribulation second coming group could defend their case. We could go either way with this. But we're only going to look at the evidence the rapture apologists are presenting. We're going to examine their evidence and not present ours. This is only going to be an examination of their evidence. Okay, here we go. I'm going to start off with Matthew 24:40. This is the first one I'm going to go over. And I just did a video on this, uh, and as you can see, beloved, they, this is one of their presentations presentations. They claim the first one taken is raptured, when in all reality it's not the case. The first one taken is drowned in the flood, and that's the analogy they're taking in the flood. But I'm not going to get sidetracked here. We're just going to look for evidence of chronology. 
Okay, uh, and then shall two be in the field, one shall be taken, the other left. Two women shall be grinding at the mill, one shall be taken, the other left. Watch therefore, for you know not what hour the Lord doth come. Do you see any chronology there, beloved? Do you see anything that mentions when? Absolutely no. Not, not, nada, no. 1 Thessalonians 5, 4, but ye brethren are not in darkness. That day should overtake you as a thief. Any evidence of chronology? No, absolutely no. Colossians 3, 4, when Christ who is our life shall appear, then shall ye also appear with him in glory. Does that say when? No, it says what, tells us what, what happens, but it does not say when. There is no when there Absolutely no chronology. 1 Corinthians 15, 51, Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall be changed. Do you see any chronology there, beloved? No, there's no when there at all. It's only what. And you have to rightly divide God's word and use this formula when you're interpreting the word of God. You have to do it the same way every time, beloved. And let's go to Luke 12, 40. But ye therefore ready also for the Son of Man cometh at, at an hour which ye think not. Now, again, no chronology, beloved. No when. There is no when in any of the scriptures I, I just presented. Not knowing the day nor hour or the hour does not imply a rapture. When these verses are looked at as a whole, most of them indicate the surprising nature of the second coming as a thief in the night, and that's the analogy. But this is the most ironic part about this whole thing. The real surprise will come when people figure out they've been duped and worship the false Messiah. And then the real one returns. And this is the real meaning of the thief in the night uh, analogy and the chronology of it, beloved. So think about that. You're on the earth. Everybody's on the earth. You know, the false Messiah is here. And all these Christians are worshiping him. And everybody thinks he's the real Messiah. And every, everybody's just dancing in the streets, including Christians. And then all of a sudden the real Messiah shows up. Can you imagine these people? They're gonna pray for the mountains to fall on them. They're gonna, this is gonna be a time like no other. They're gonna be so full of shame. It's really gonna be hard to explain. And this, this time is coming, beloved. This time is coming. Now, not, oh, let's see, okay. Let's move on here. Uh, the doctrine, now I'm going to go over this doctrine of imminent return or the any moment doctrine. And that's what the rapture doctrine is called. It's called the any moment doctrine. Now the doctrine of imminent return among rapture apologists is void of any starting point. In other words, there had to be a starting point in which the return of Christ was imminent. And they completely ignore 2 Thessalonians 2, 4 as a starting point because it counters the any moment doctrine. Uh, you can't have both, beloved. And it can't be any moment until after the man of sin is revealed in the holy place and he claims to be God. He's standing in the holy place claiming to be God. This is such a very important point, beloved. This is a benchmark in Christian history and world history. This is, the, this is a moment that everybody will, will experience when the Antichrist appears on the earth claiming to be Christ. And beloved, he is going to deceive many Christians into believing that he's the real Christ. Okay, so... To, now, if you can't... 2 Thessalonians 2, 4 is a starting point because only then, after that takes place... Can the, the return of Christ be imminent? And beloved, that has not occurred yet. It simply has not occurred. So the return of Christ cannot be imminent. It's impossible for it to be imminent at this time, beloved. And you just can't get around that fact. Okay, rapture apologists have replaced the concept of a thief in the night with imminent return in a bait and switch with scriptures and their meanings. 
It's called textual hijacking. Without a starting point, nothing is imminent. And the same goes for chronology. You can't present scripture that you say represents chronology when in reality there's none there at all. And there's a big difference between what and when when you're talking about Bible hermeneutics, okay? And chronology is exclusive in its meaning, and it's strictly regarding time and its passing, beloved. You can't add and subtract things from it when you're using this formula. Who, what, when, where, and how have no bearing on the mechanics of chronology. To interchange it, uh, with the other four is just plain bad reading and, and comprehension skills. This goes against all the laws of reading, beloved. You can't just read God's word and violate the laws at your whim and when you want to make something fit your own narrative, beloved. Now, let's move on. We're going to go to Philippians 3.20 and their, their presentation of evidence for the pre-trib rapture. For our conversation is in heaven from whence also we look for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Do you see any when there? There is no when absolutely at all there. It doesn't say when. It just says what. In Matthew 24, 34. Verily I say unto you, this generation shall not pass till all these things be fulfilled. Do you see any when there? Again, No. All right, now we're going to go over this, the first one taken, one, you know, taken away in the flood and this whole nonsense about I want to be the first one taken. And the subject is established here, and, and you can't depart from this subject, uh, beloved, when you're looking at this. The ones taken away in the, are taken away in the flood, and they're drowned. And this is, this is where this is found, Matthew 24, 39. And this is not part of their evidence. This is part of our evidence against the pre-trib rapture. It's found in Matthew 24, 39. And knew not until the flood came and took them all away. So shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. Now, just examine the language that's used in the other Gospels when this, is, when this term is used, took them all away, uh, the, the first one taken. Just look at this terminology here. The first ones taken are taken away in a flood of lies. They're taken by the Antichrist. Okay, beloved? All right, now let's go to these scriptures where this is mentioned, and we're going to go to Luke 17, 34, and then we go back to their evidence for the pre-trib rapture. I tell you, in that night there shall be two men in one bed, and one shall be taken, and the other shall be left. And beloved, the one taken is taken away by Antichrist in a flood of lies. The two women shall be grinding together, one shall be taken, and the other left. Again, the one taken is taken away by the Antichrist in the flood. Two men shall be in the field, one taken and the other left. Same thing, beloved. And again, no chronology here, no when. It just tells you what. Okay, let's go to John 17, 15. Pray not that thou shouldest take them out of the world, but thou shouldest keep them from the evil. And they, this, this implies that God has to rapture you out of the earth, out of the world before he can keep you from evil. And this just completely limits the, the power of God. This is so ridiculous. They equate keeping you from evil with a rapture. And, and they, they, they believe that the only way God can spare you from his own wrath is to rapture you away. But if you really think about it, beloved, the, our, our God is awesome. He can pour his wrath on, out on you no matter where you're at. He can pour it, he can be selective as a laser beam, or he can be as collective as the entire world, beloved. Don't limit the power of God. Okay? And again, this says nothing about when. Nothing. Not nada. Zilch. Revelation twenty two twelve, and behold, I come quickly, and my, my reward is with me to give every man according to his work shall be. Again, no evidence of chronology. 1 Thessalonians 5, 2, For yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so cometh as a thief in the night. Again, beloved, no chronology. 
Saying it comes as a thief in the night does not imply pre-tribulation rapture. I'm sorry. And here's one of the main ones they used, uh, uh, 1 Thessalonians 5, 9, for God has not appointed us to wrath, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. Beloved, do you see anything uh, there about, um, you know, about pre-tribulation or anything? Of course, God has not appointed, appointed Christians to wrath. If you're in good standing with the Lord, you're not appointed to wrath. I mean, they, they make it sound as if Christians who are in good standing with the Lord are subject to wrath, and that's nonsense, just absolute nonsense, beloved. They just, they just add and take away from the scriptures at their whim and just stick in subjects where there's no subject or object, no article, nothing. And they just violate all the laws of reading. All right, let's go to Matthew 24, 44. There, therefore, be also ready for in such an hour as ye think of the Son of Man may come. Again, no chronology, beloved, none, no when at all. Titus 2.13, looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, uh, Lord, the Lord Jesus Christ. Now this one they mess up. They claim that the blessed hope is the rapture. But the blessed hope is your salvation in the Lord Jesus Christ. You look forward to the Lord fulfilling that after you die, right? So this, this is speaking about future tense, but it's speaking about... Uh, the, the, the blessed hope that every Christian has of eternal life. The blessed hope is not the rapture. The rapture and the blessed hope are two separate things. Your blessed hope is not in the rapture. Your blessed hope is in your salvation in Jesus Christ. And they confuse the two and they conflate both of these into one in error. Again, just plain bad, faulty reading and violating all the rules of reading. Okay, let's go to Matthew 24. Uh, no, let's go to uh, Revelation 19, 14. Uh, and back to their body of evidence. And the armies which were in heaven followed him among white horses, clothed in fine linen, white and clean. Again, that sounds, that's beautiful, beloved. That's, this, that's, that's what happens at the seven trump, but this is not the rapture. This is not any, has anything to do with chronology. Again, no when mentioned here at all. No chronology. All right, let's go to 1 Thessalonians 2.19. For what is our hope or joy or crown of rejoicing? On a, are not even ye in the presence of our Lord Jesus Christ at his coming? Again, no mention of when, beloved. Again, again, again. Luke 10.20, all these things are delivered to me of my Father, and no man knoweth who the Son is, but the Father, and who the Father is, but the Son, and whom uh, the Son will reveal him. Again, no chronology, beloved. Matthew 25.31, when the Son of Man shall come in his glory, and all the holy angels with him, then shall he sit upon the throne of his glory. No when, beloved, again, just what will happen? It's a big difference. Matthew 28, 20, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I'm with you always, even unto the end of the world. No chronology. Again, Luke 17, 37, and they answered and said unto him, Where, Lord? And he said unto them, Wheresoever the body is, thither will the eagles be gathered together. Again, no chronology. None. No when. Matthew 24, 36, but of that day and hour knoweth no man, not the angels of heaven, but my Father only. Again, no when, no when at all, no chronology attached to that at all. Romans 5, 9, much more then, being now justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. No chronology, beloved, no chronology. Again, they mention, they bring up this word wrath. Like it's a universal, you know, it, they use that wrath, they just butcher it. They completely butcher it and take it out of context every time they talk about it. Mark 13, 32, for the Son of Man is a man taking a far journey who left his house and gave authority to his servants. And every man is work and commanded the porter to watch. No chronology, none. 
Matthew 24, 27, For as the lightning cometh out of the east and shineth even to the west, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. No when, beloved, no chronology, none. Jeremiah 35, and this is Jacob's trouble. For thus saith the Lord, we have heard the voice of trembling and fear and not of peace. Ask ye now and see whether a man doth travail with child. Wherefore, do I see every man with his hands on his loins as a woman in travail, and all faces are turned to paleness or blackness? And, and now here's Jeremiah 37. This is the only one that they'll quote when they, when they use this for their evidence. Alas, for that day is great, so that none is like it, and even the time of Jacob's trouble, but he shall be saved out of it. And they, they think that being saved out of it means a rapture, but it's not. It's not, beloved. It doesn't, it doesn't say being saved. It doesn't say you're raptured because you're saved out of it. You're saved out of it because of God's grace and his selective wrath. Okay, God is not limited to where you're at to enable, in order to pour his wrath out, beloved. You have to grasp that. And if you look at these verses here, this explains to me a man that is so completely confused about this, the second coming that he doesn't know the difference between a spiritual child and a, a regular child like a lot of people in this generation they think that the scripture that's talking about well unto those who give suck and are with child in those days are, is really talking about a literal child, but it's not. And this basically to me is explaining the confusion that will exist in the, last, in the last days. And that the only ones who will be saved out of this Jacob's trouble are the ones who have the seal of God's in their, God on their forehead. They know the chronology of the return of Christ, and they know that the false Messiah comes first, beloved. All right, let's move on with this. This is one of the worst ones, the most egregious of all of them, and it's found in John 14, 3. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I'll come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, that you, you may be there also. And beloved, they use this one all the time. This is like one of the most popular ones they use. Beloved, there's absolutely no chronology in this verse. It doesn't say when. I'm sorry. It just says what. It just tells you what will happen, not when. And beloved, you have to rightly divide this. You can't just add this and claim there's chronology here. There's none, absolutely none. This is like one of my favorite verses. I love this verse. But they butcher it. They completely take it out of context. And I could think of a few of the people that do this, their names right now. But you know, beloved, I don't mention names. And they just butcher this every time they turn around. All right, let's continue. Mark 14, 62. And Jesus said, I am. I am. And ye shall see the Son of Man sitting on the right hand of power coming in the clouds of heaven. Again, that's the seventh trump, but no chronology there. It says what will happen, not, but not when. Matthew 24, 22, and except those days should be shortened, there should be no flesh saved, but for the elect's sake, those days should be shortened. And beloved, they actually use this verse and take it out of context uh, but this, this verse right here, 24-22, is actually detrimental to, to their cause. It actually disproves it. And they still use it anyway. And it shows you how limited they are in their understanding of the scriptures. The, this is speaking about Christians who are on the earth at the time of the Antichrist. And if those days weren't shortened, that they would all, everybody would be deceived and the, the rapture people claim that the Christians are gone at this time, but they still use this. This is, this is so ridiculous. It's just dumb. It's absolutely dumb. I don't know how else to say it. Now, let's just uh, slowly go over 1 Thessalonians 4.13, which is their number one rapture doctrine uh, scriptures. But I would not have you ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, that you sorrow not even as others which have no hope. Beloved, this is speaking about the people who have died in the past and, and then the people who were Christians. 
and non-Christians. Non-Christians don't have any hope for eternal life, so they do. They're in sorrow. And so this is concerning those who have fallen asleep or those who've died. That's the subject. It's established here in verse 13. You can't depart from it, beloved. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so, them which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. So if you believe that Christ died and rose again, then you should believe that those who have died in the past have died and rose again too. And they're with him, beloved. And they will come back with Christ at his return. In other words, they will resurrect from paradise to a higher level of of existence or a, a different plane of existence to come back with Christ at the seventh trump. They don't rise up out of a hole in the ground, beloved. This is talking about a resurrection from paradise, okay? People don't rise up out of a hole in the ground. Nobody's lying in a hole in the ground, hole in the ground. okay? That's all this is speaking about. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. It's just saying that you cannot precede those who have already died because they're already with Christ. And when he comes back, he'll bring all of those back with him. And we can't precede those who have already died. They're already with Christ. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout with the voice of an archangel and the trump of God and the dead and Christ shall rise first. They will rise. In other words, they come from paradise with Christ they have already risen. And that's what it's saying. They've already risen. They shall rise first. And it really should be saying they've already risen. And they're going to come back with him at the seventh trump, with the trump of God. Okay? That's all it's saying, beloved. Then we, then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Now, this verse is the most confusing out of all of them. You have to go back to the Greek to look at this verse. You look at clouds, it's nephos. It's a big, it's a large group. It's not a literal cloud. And air, air is, is, is your breath of life body. Your pneuma, your pneuma, and your suki, that's your breath of life body. You'll meet the Lord in your spiritual body. And you, so shall we ever be with the Lord. So this is saying, then shall we, who are alive and remain, shall be caught up together. In other words, caught up means you're going to, you're basically going to die. You will be changed. That's what happens when you're caught up together. And then you will meet everybody in a big group. This is the biggest family, family reunion in history. That's what this verse is Speaking about that gigantic family reunion in the clouds, in the people, the group of people. This is going to be a giant group of people. It's going to be the biggest. It's going to be all of the world's population from all times, beloved. And that's what this verse is speaking about. And here we have the last one, Revelation 3.10. Because thou hast kept the word of my patience, I will also keep thee from the hour of temptation which shall come upon all the world to try them that dwell upon the earth. And beloved, this is so ridiculous. When you, when you say the word all, what do you think that means? <laughs> it means all. It, it doesn't mean part. It means everybody will be going through this hour of temptation. The hour of temptation is when you're delivered up before the Antichrist to give your testimony for Jesus Christ. You have to be here on earth to do that. And this is the hour of temptation. And what God is saying, when you're saved out of it, it means you will not be tempted by the Antichrist. So you will not be tempted by him, so you'll be saved out of it. doesn't mean you're going to be raptured. You can't just jump to conclusions like that. And that's exactly what they do with this. Okay, now we got our last. This is the end of this lecture, beloved, but... Um, I read this last little uh, statement here. Talk about jumping to conclusions. There is not one scripture in this group that actually points to any chronology, beloved. Not one. 
And if you're going to use them as inferences, then you need a starting point, a reference point. And again, there is none. Okay? And in fact, there's not one direct reference to a pre-tribulation rapture in the entire Bible. And beloved, why would you believe a doctrine of the Bible that's not mentioned in the Bible? I mean, this to me is so completely ludicrous. It's, it's, it's almost insanity. Okay? So anyway, beloved, you have it. Every one of the scriptures, not every one, I, I may have left out a couple, but these are the ones that they're using to teach you the pre-tribulation rapture. They add chronology where there is absolutely none, and I read them all for you, beloved. There's no implication of chronology in any, not one of these scriptures they use. Okay, I get a little excited about this, beloved. And I think I did get a little excited on my last video and maybe pushed it a little too far. But, beloved, I love all my brethren, even though I make fun of them. I, I, I love you, even if you believe in the rapture doctrine. I want so much for you to come out of confusion. It's because of that love I have for you. Anyway, Merry Christmas to all of you and much love from me to you. And we'll see you on the next one.